Our scripture reading this morning uh, comes from 1 Samuel chapter 21, uh, verses 1 through 6, as we continue our sermon series on uh, David and um, uh, David, a man after God's own heart. Today we're going to be looking at his experience with uh, the priest Ahimelech, a place called Nob, and his um, request to receive holy bread. So listen for the word of God. David came to Nob to the priest Ahimelech. Ahimelech came trembling to meet David and said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? David said to the priest Ahimelech, The king has charged me with a matter and said to me, No one must know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I have charged you. I've made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what have you at hand? Give me five loaves of bread, or whatever is here. The priest answered David, I have no ordinary bread at hand, only holy bread, provided that the young men have kept themselves from women. David answered the priest, Indeed, women have been kept from us, as always, when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy, even when it is a common journey. How much more today? Will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there except the bread of the presence, which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. This is God's word. Amen. You pray with me. Holy God, you take that which is common, and you sanctify it. You make it holy before your sight, just as you take that which is holy and you send it out into the world to be used for the purposes of building your kingdom. Help us to hear that message, especially this morning, through the witness of David. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, have you ever thought about how we ought to treat those things that are holy and how we ought to treat those things that are worldly? What the difference is between the sacred and the secular, what the distinction is between the exalted and the everyday. There's something of that question wrapped up in this story that we read about David this morning. But to get there, we need to ask ourselves, how in the world is it that David finds himself before the priest Ahimelech in the town of Nob? Now, the victory over Goliath, the story that we read last week, was the event that rose David to prominence in the eyes of all Israel, and it's also the event that rose David to prominence in the eyes of King Saul. Indeed, the scripture tells us that it was after David's victory over Goliath that Saul pressed David to become a commander in his army, and David began to grow close to Saul's family. He developed a, a very fast, a very deep, and a lifelong friendship with Saul's son, Jonathan, and he eventually wed Saul's daughter, Michael, so that David was kind of knit together with Saul's family. And yet there is an irony in all of this, because it is the very event that takes David to prominence. It's the very event that draws David close to Saul's family that ends up planting the seeds for the destruction of David's relationship with Saul as well. Because, you see, it's the very prominence, it's the very prestige, and it's the very power that David gained through his confrontation with Goliath and his victory over Goliath that caused uh, the seeds of a deep and abiding jealousy to be planted within Saul. Saul, who was an older man, saw David, who was a younger man, as a rival to his own power and his own position in Israel, and he very quickly began to resent David. In fact, the story in 1 Samuel speaks about Saul's anger towards David and says that an evil spirit uh, entered Saul when David came to court. The scripture in 1 Samuel 18, 12 reads simply, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, 
but had departed from Saul. So in some sense, Saul's jealousy towards David is grounded in the fact that Saul recognizes that God's favor is now resting upon David rather than resting upon himself. And this was a time, and this was an era, when politics was played for keeps. There wouldn't be any sending David back to tend to his father's sheep outside of Bethlehem. And it wasn't even the case that uh, Saul could simply dismiss David from the royal service to allow him to make out life on his own, to seek his own path. No, the thing that occurred to Saul as the most natural thing in the world was for him to kill his rival, for him to kill David or to have him killed. And over the course of the next several months, as David remains in Saul's court, Saul's anger towards him grows, it increases, and Saul does actively seek out David's death. The scripture tells us that at least on a couple of occasions, when Saul was either in a fit of rage or a fit of drunkenness, David is there in his uh, court and Saul takes a spear and hurls it at David in an attempt to pin him against the wall. It tells us that when he sent David out to fight the Philistines, he would send him into those situations and into those battles where the odds were against David in the hopes that the Philistines would overcome him and do his dirty work for him. And yet, ironically, instead of the Philistines overcoming David, David overcame the odds that were stacked against him, which only increased his prestige and his popularity in Israel. So failing at those means, Saul then turns to his own family members. He turns to Jonathan, who has become David's close friend. He attempts to get his son Jonathan to kill David to no avail. And then after David weds Michael, Saul's daughter, uh, Saul finds out when David and Michael are going to be uh, lounging around one morning, lying in bed together, and he stalks David with his men in an attempt to capture him. But Michael lets David out in a secret way and thereby avoids what Saul, her father, was wanting to do against him. Well, in all of these ways... Saul's assassination attempts failed, but they didn't fail in convincing David that hanging around Saul's court was the last thing that he needed to do. And so David takes a few of his companions, his close friends or allies, and he flees the capital. He flees David's court. And that's where we find him today, uh, encountering the chief priest of all of Israel in the town called Nob, which is called in the Bible the City of Priests. Now, when we think about priests in the Old Testament, and when we think about where the worship of Israel went on, we mostly think about the temple, don't we? And where was the temple located? Well, the temple is located in Jerusalem, which is the capital. But this is so far back in Israel's history, this is so early on, that Jerusalem has not even been established as the capital yet. In fact, it's David who is going to conquer, is, or conquer Jerusalem and going to make Jerusalem the capital and center worship there. But until that time, the worship of Israel was taking place in different parts around the country. And at this particular moment, it's taking place in Nob, where Ahimelech and all of the priests of Aaron have gathered to attempt as best they can to carry out the law of Moses so that the ritual worship of God can continue, even in the midst of all this turmoil and these attacks and these incursions by the Philistines. Now, if you've read this part of 1 Samuel, you know that up to this point, from the time that David flees Saul's court until he arrives in Nob, it's a very, very fast-paced story. In fact, it reads almost like something of a chase scene where David and his companions stay one step ahead of Saul all the time, and Saul is constantly trying to catch up with him so he can do David in. And so I say it's a very fast-paced, a very interesting story, but it doesn't really get intriguing until we get to the conversation between David and the chief priest, Ahimelech. Now, up to this point in David's story, as the Bible has narrated David's life, we can see how the title, The Man After God's Own Heart, makes a lot of sense because David has been presented in entirely positive fashion. He's been cast in an entirely positive light. 
from the time that he was brought, you know, doing good, solid work outdoors, working with his hands, serving his father, uh, to be anointed by Samuel as Israel's future king. To the point where he went before Goliath and when all of Israel's army was shaking in its boots, David and David's faith in God proved victorious over Goliath. To the way in which he then faithfully serves Saul, he serves faithfully in Saul's court and as a commander over Saul's army against the Philistines. All of, this th all of these ways, in all of these ways, David has been presented positively. But here, finally... In the conversation with Ahimelech, we're going to find a David who is a much more ambivalent character. We're going to find a David who in some ways is something of a foreshadowing of the David who is to come. A David who has almost as many negatives connected with the positives in his personality and his character. Now, Nob was the place of Israel's worship. It was the place where Ahimelech and the priests carried out the ritual sacrifices on behalf of the nation. But when David shows up in Nob, he's not very interested in worshiping. In fact, he's interested in just getting some grub. David shows up and he's hungry. He's famished. He doesn't have a weapon on him. And he's on the run from Saul, and he realizes that if he can't find a place to stop off and refuel his tanks, then he's not going to stay in front of Saul much longer. So he goes to Ahimelech, and he asks him first for bread. And then he asks him if he has a weapon, since he left his own sword uh, back in Saul's court. But when he goes to Ahimelech, he doesn't tell him the reason that he's there. He doesn't tell him that he's a fugitive from justice. He doesn't tell him that he's on the run from King Saul. He doesn't appeal to Ahimelech's sense of faithfulness to God since David himself is one who is known as faithful to God. Instead, for whatever reason, David just out and out lies to Ahimelech. He tells him not that he is on the run from King Saul, but rather that he is on a secret mission from King Saul. And being on a secret mission from King Saul, Ahimelech, oh, you wouldn't have heard about this. It's being kept very hush-hush. And the band of men that are with me carrying out this secret mission, my Navy SEALs, they're on the outskirts of town. And I need food not just for me, but for them also. So give me what you have. Now, Ahimelech... He's clearly nervous. He knows that Saul and David are on the outs. He knows that David is not very high up on Saul's list of favorite people. It says that he came to David shivering, somewhat afraid of what it was that he's going to find. But when David makes his request, regardless of whether or not Ahimelech realizes David's duplicity, whether or not he realizes David's deception, Ahimelech tells him, well, I do have bread. But the bread which I have is no ordinary bread. Instead, it is the bread of the presence. Now, the bread of the presence is the most sacred bread in all of Israel. It's bread that is baked only by the priests of Aaron, only by Ahimelech and his assistants, and it's baked every week before the Sabbath so that it can be laid upon the altar. The command for this goes back to the law of Moses, which was the very law the priests were attempting to keep. If you look in Leviticus chapter 24, you'll find it written that this bread, this bread of the presence, is to be set out before the Lord regularly, Sabbath after Sabbath, on behalf of the Israelites as an everlasting covenant. What this meant, in other words, is that this is not the kind of bread that you slice up and make tuna fish sandwiches out of. Instead, it's the kind of bread that you bake with the intention of giving a thanks offering to God for nothing more, I mean, for nothing less than rescuing Israel out of the land of Egypt, out of Pharaoh's house of slavery, carrying the Israelites through the wilderness, feeding them with what? Feeding them with bread of heaven, right? With the manna in the wilderness. And so that this bread that is baked every single week and laid upon the altar before the Lord is Israel's way of remembering and of giving thanks to God for the gift and the salvation that God has offered Israel. In other words, 
This bread is a holy thing. And yet that is what David has asked for. That's what David, in his worldly approach of manipulation and of deception, has asked this holy man for. Taking a worldly avenue or a worldly angle to try to swindle this holy man out of his holy bread. And that's exactly what he does. Ahimelech doesn't question David's motives. He takes what he says at face value. He does ask him a couple of questions, making sure that he has remained pure. But having been satisfied by David's answers, Ahimelech gives him the bread of the presence. And then David asks again for some means of defending himself. And so Ahimelech doesn't just give him the bread, but Ahimelech offers him the sword of Goliath, the very sword that David had taken from Goliath's own dead body a few years previously and had been in the care of the priests ever since. And with that, David goes from the holy place back out into the world to continue his run from Saul. Now, let me ask again the question from the beginning. Have you ever thought about how it is that we're supposed to treat holy things? And how it is that we're supposed to treat worldly things? Have you ever thought about what the difference is between the sacred and the secular? What the distinction is between the exalted and the everyday? You know, our tendency, I think, is to believe that things are always supposed to be separated, that things that are holy are holy, and things that are everyday or ho-hum or secular or worldly are intended to stay that way, and never the twain shall meet. A few years ago when I was in seminary, I had the opportunity to go to a Jewish worship service at a synagogue with a friend of mine who was Jewish. I had never been before, and she invited me, so I went. It was a fascinating service. It was a beautiful service, a service with which I was entirely unfamiliar before. But that night, the thing that I remember most is not the way that the service went itself, but it was rather an interaction that my friend and I had in the midst of it. You see, she came from a Jewish background. She was born into a Jewish family, but she had only become observant as a young adult. And when she had become observant, she had kind of jumped in with both feet, but she was still so new to the faith of her own background that she didn't have down exactly what she was supposed to be doing in the worship service. Have you ever been at a worship service like that? You're not quite sure when you're supposed to talk and when you're not, when you're supposed to stand up and when you're supposed to sit down. Well, that's kind of how my friend was, and, and she was doing her best, and I was watching her. But at one point in the worship service, we had our prayer books out, and it came time for us to put the prayer books down and to bow our heads and begin to pray. And so um, in order to free up her hands, my friend took her prayer book, and she set it on the floor beside her chair. No sooner had she done that than an usher rushes up to us and grabs the prayer book off of the floor, shoves it back into her hands, and with a very stern look says, the word of God should never touch the dirt of the floor. Now, our ushers don't do that in here, don't worry. But there it is, isn't it? I mean, there's the distinction between the sacred and the secular. There's the, the idea behind the fact that we're supposed to treat things that are holy different from things that are worldly, uh, things that are exalted different from things that are everyday. It's almost an attitude that we take by instinct when it comes to the things that we think of as holy, isn't it? But here's the interesting thing about the story of David at Nob. The story of David at Nob troubles all of that. It messes it up. Because what David is doing is he's coming from a very worldly place. I mean, this is a man with blood on his hands for right or for wrong, whether it was for good or for ill. I mean, he is a general in Saul's army. And when he comes before this holy man, this priest Ahimelech, he's not up front with him. He's not honest. But instead, he deceives him intentionally. He lies to him. He's a worldly man coming with very worldly motivations. And yet what does, what does Ahimelech do? Ahimelech takes that which is holy 
and he gives it to this very worldly man so he can continue to work out God's purposes for him in the world. In other words, what we find in David, the story of David and Ahimelech is that God takes things that are holy and uses them to build his kingdom. I mean, think about it. God uses Jonathan. God uses Michael. God uses even the Philistines later on. David will seek refuge with the Philistines to get protection from Saul. So if God can use Philistines or God can use plain old everyday people like Michael and Jonathan, why can't God use holy bread to help the one that God has chosen to be Israel's anointed king? What the encounter at Nob shows us is that God's will is more important than the rituals that we are given to worship God. And that there are times where mercy and justice trump that which we believe to be proper religious ritual in order that God's will can be pursued out in the world. The bread of the presence, it's a fine religious ritual. It serves an important purpose. There are people who will use that word ritual in a, just a negative way, as if the idea of a ritual is a bad thing. I don't think the idea of a ritual is a bad thing at all. What that particular ritual was doing in Israel's life is that it was reminding Israel of who God was and of what God had done for Israel in rescuing them out of slavery. And even more than just reminding Israel, that ritual was helping Israel to continue to give thanks to God, to worship God for that. And yet, as important as that ritual is, as important as that act of worship is, of laying the bread of the presence out, it does not supersede God's own desire to see his will be done in the world through David. Centuries and centuries later, Jesus himself will actually bring up this very story. In fact, it's one of the few Old Testament stories that Jesus really kind of quotes or at least paraphrases in detail. I mean, he kind of goes on and on about it, and it happens not just once, but in three different Gospels. The story goes like this. I'm going to read it to you from Mark chapter 2. It says, One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what's unlawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In those days, David entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is unlawful, which, excuse me, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, So the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Now, what is the Sabbath? And what is this argument Jesus is having? Well, the Sabbath is a holy thing. Like the law about the bread of the presence, the Sabbath is something that is laid out in the law of Moses. In fact, it makes the Ten Commandments. It makes one of the big ten. And the Sabbath is a day that is intended to be set aside for rest and for worship. It's in observance of the fact that God himself rested on the seventh day. And by blocking out this part of time, we're intended to have a way that we can relate to God, that we can grow to know who God is. I mean, if we don't ever stop, if we don't ever come to church, if you don't ever pause with one another to focus in our prayers and in our study of Scripture and in our worship on God, then how will we ever grow closer to Him? And yet what Jesus is pointing out here in a very important way is that God took this holy thing and He intended to be he intended it to be used for his own worldly purposes. God doesn't want his kingdom just to remain up in heaven, just to remain up in the clouds, but rather God wants his kingdom to be spread out upon the earth. And what that means is that the Sabbath, a holy day, a holy uh, denomination of time, is meant to be used for us, very worldly people out in the world itself. And this is a teaching that is being given to us by the Son of God himself, who, after all, is the most holy thing that this world has ever known. And yet being God has come down in the worldly reality of the flesh to bring salvation to us. And you know what else? 
This is about us too. Because ultimately what God wants to do, the holy thing that God wants to use for his worldly purposes, in the same way that he used the bread of the presence to fund David's ability to escape, is that God wants to use us for his purposes in the world. Now sometimes when I tell y'all that you're holy, you kind of look at me out of the kind of corner of your eye. I'm not sure that you always trust me when I say that, and I've said it before and I'll say it again. But if you look in the scriptures, what you find are things like this from 1 Corinthians. Do you not know that your bodies, that your very bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you and whom you've received from God? And turning over to 1 Peter chapter 2, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a royal priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You are a chosen people, Peter says, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And if we take that seriously, if we take seriously that the holy things of this world are not just the bread of the presence and not just Sabbath, but that the holy thing of this world include us, God's people, then what we have to recognize is that the deepest desire of God's own heart is to use holy things in order to build his kingdom in this world. For us, what this means is that we have to focus on what it means to, worship, to move from worship to mission. Now, we usually think about worship as what we're doing right now, but we can think about worship as any act of devotion, any prayer that we pray, any time that we pause to read Scripture or to read some kind of a devotional writing that causes us to think about God. All of these things are acts of worship, and God wants us to do all of them, just as God wanted Israel to continue to observe the bread of the presence. But God does not want us to stop with that. Because ultimately, there must come a time when the worship service ends. Ultimately, there must come a time when an amen is said on the end of a prayer. Ultimately, there must come a time when you finish your scripture reading and the Bible is closed. And the thing that God wants us to understand is that the Christian life does not end there. But rather, the Christian life begins there. Because when we move from worship out into the world, we are moving from the place where we can rest, where we can know Sabbath, where we can grow close to Jesus Christ, out into the world where we can carry out his purposes that his kingdom might be brought about in our very midst. And just as Ahimelech gave the bread of the presence to David so that David could carry out his mission for God in the world, so too does God give us Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life to us, that we who by that living bread have been declared holy might ourselves go out into the world to carry out his purposes and continue serving uh, the work that he is doing in building his kingdom. Now sometimes, sometimes, that looks like something as simple as moving the altar to the side and the pulpit out of the way so that a great big cartoon VBS set can be set up in your regular worship space. So that mission can be done with the children of this church and mission can be done with the children who came from further afield into this church to learn about Jesus last week. And sometimes, sometimes that mission looks like giving of a week of your summer when you could be doing anything else so you can go out into the community through local mission project and help to represent the love and compassion of Jesus Christ in the world as some of you and many of our youth will be doing a few days hence. But what mission always looks like, what it always looks like, is asking ourselves the question, what happens after the worship service is ended, after the benediction is said? What happens after the amen is given at the end of the prayer? What happens after the Bible reading is over and your Bible is closed? How is it that you, you holy thing, are answering the call of God to go out into the world and to be used for his purposes? That his kingdom 
that his kingdom might be spread across the earth. For as God did that for David, so will God do that for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite Patrick and the praise team to go ahead and come back up. And I want to offer you this invitation as we prepare to sing our closing song. The invitation that I want to offer you is the invitation that Ahimelech gave David, where despite his worldly background and despite his worldly motivations for asking, received a precious and a holy gift, not so that that gift could remain upon the altar, not so that it could remain in the sanctuary, but so that it could feed David, that he could go out into the world and carry out the mission that God had given him. God offers you bread too. He offers you the living bread, the bread of his grace, the bread that comes by Jesus. And as he offers you that bread, so too does he call you to go out into the world. What is your mission? How will you serve? Let's stand and sing together.